So Sean looks like he's ready to go. I'll just turn it over to him for a couple of minutes here. Perfect. And, and hopefully everybody can still hear me. Uh, I went on mute and I came back off of mute and teams doesn't tend to like my, my phone set up here. So somebody just want to come off of mute real quick and confirm that they can hear me still and they can see design X up on the screen. Yep. I can see DX and I can hear you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Greg. And for everybody else on the line, if you wouldn't mind just making sure that you are muted, there has been a little bit of background noise here and that is kind of distracting for everybody that's on the call. Um, what I'm going to do real quick here, since I have a Roamer arm set up in my garage, is uh, I'm going to share my, my webcam just to highlight a little bit more of the overall scanning experience. Um, this is something that you guys see quite often anyways, just the, the arm moving around. But I do want to prove that this is in real time just uh, uh, for the benefit of everybody here. So um, we do have a dedicated, uh, really detailed setup guide for how to connect your Roamer arm or hexagon arm to all of our software. Uh, we've got some videos coming as well. They should be in the, uh, the sales toolkit, the hexagon sales toolkit shortly. Um, so I'm not going to go through a, a completely deep dive in terms of how to get your hardware set up, but I will go over some of the high points and then I'll just do a, a quick scanning demonstration uh, on this part. So you should see on my webcam here, hopefully this is the gas valve part. Um, we've had these 3D printed, and if you want one of them, let us know. We can uh, probably, I think we have a, a bunch of spares that we've dedicated to sending out to Hexagon folks. Um, so if you want to have this in your arsenal in addition to the normal Hexagon demo block and some of the other uh, demo parts that you have, let us know, and we'll uh, try and get one over to you as, as shortly as possible. Um, what I'll do here is, is explain just two things really quickly inside of the software. First of all, on the user interface, um, Sean, yo, Sean, um, we cannot see your webcam if you are showing us apart. Just FYI. Oh. Okay. Well, it says that it's going, and it also says my lights on, but it's not really necessary. I may not have enough no bandwidth to really do both, so we'll uh, we'll go ahead and and cancel mm -hmm. that portion of it. Uh, and we'll just go on with the screen share here. So the first thing that you need to do when running a hexagon arm inside of DesignX is access the live capture tools. And the, we can do that in two places. First of all, in DesignX, we have a home tab here. And this is actually a really good thing for people doing software demonstrations in the, the software where Essentially, this tab that we've had built here is a end-to-end -end software product demonstration, uh, start to finish. It starts with you know either opening or importing a file or connecting directly to your scanner, running a scan process, processing the data, and then going through modeling and then exporting or live transferring the data out into another CAD package. Uh, the more dedicated tab here called Live Capture is what we'll use to access all of the options for scanning and probing into DesignX. Um, I've already connected my, my Roamer arm here, and I've already played around with the RDS control panel a little bit to make sure everything is connected. Um, but the first thing that you'll need to do is you'll need to find the Roamer absolute in the drop-down list here, and make sure that you select the absolute for the, the newest crop of arms. Um, for one reason or another, the infinite stinger, the old generation of hexagon arms, is higher up on the list. So don't select that because that uses... Um, win RDS, I believe, and that's not going to talk to the arm properly. You have to scroll down and find Roamer Absolute here. And there is a little bit of background noise on the call, so if you could just make sure that you're muted, let me uh, please take a second to do that. I just thought. Once I have the Absolute selected here, I'll hit Device Connected, and if I disconnect here, it'll tell me it's disconnected. If I reconnect, you'll just get that prompt saying All right, baby. we are connected and ready to scan. And I don't know, Chris and, and Greg, since we're kind of owners of the meeting here, do you have the ability? I think somebody actually muted me. Can everybody still hear me? Yep, you're good again. Okay, perfect. Um, if I need to access the, the drivers, of course, I can find them in my you know, start menu here and play around with the RDS control panel. 
Um, I can also get to a couple of scanner settings using the setting gear icon here on the live capture tab. Uh, again, this is not going to be a full setup guide for DesignX and Hexagon Arms. I'm not going to go through every single option here, but the high points inside of the live capture settings are as follows. Basically, the first page here kind of indicates how things are viewed within the software. If we're going to rotate the view dynamically while we're scanning, um, we can also and I definitely recommend doing this, disable the sound while measuring, simply because nobody likes to hear that machine gun noise while we are collecting data. Um, on the probe tab here, we have the ability to probe scan data points, essentially just the XYZ points, either by holding the probe steady on the part or by holding the A button or the trigger button down and dragging it across the part to do a probe scan. We can also play around with some compensation options here. And then uh, with the scan data tab, this is basically the post-processing of the raw data from RDS into DesignX. And you'll notice at the top, we've got two options to either scan as a point cloud or scan to a mesh. And by default, the scan to a mesh is an option or it's, it's the selected option rather. Um, this is really useful for a lot of reasons, but primarily it just looks better during a demo. When you're scanning directly to a, a polygon object, it's a shell, it's a not see-through object. So it just renders a little bit better on screen and it's a better experience overall. Um, I can kind of control the grid size, the triangle size that I have here and some other options. I can also choose to back up the data uh, while I'm scanning as well. On the device tab, this actually is what allows us to access some of the RDS options. So if I want to go through and calibrate the, the arm uh, for any reason or, or calibrate a new probe on there, I can access that from here. If I want to play around with my laser settings, I can do that here. And for those of you that are going to be doing demonstrations in front of customers, uh, I think generally everybody in the 3D scanning game kind of recommends um, detuning the lasers down to a more manageable file size, especially for desktop size parts. The amount of data that, especially in RS6, can collect nowadays is absolutely staggering and kind of unnecessary for the majority of the parts that we're going to scan. So nobody wants to be stuck in a demo kind of trying to talk over a piece of software tool, processing scan data for three, four, five minutes uh, before they see a result. So. Our recommendation generally is, you know, I know that 44% or so is the point sampling by default. I've got an RS3 here, so it may be different with an RS6. Um, but somewhere in that range, less than 50% is good enough. And again, for me, since I just had to reinstall these drivers, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the um, automatic exposure in the advanced setup here. Because I like the way that that works a little bit better. I'll choose 33% sampling here, just because I really don't need that level of uh, precision or resolution for a basic demonstration part. Uh, and of course, any other options that I need to change while I'm in the RDS control panel, I can do while I'm in here. And the last thing that we have here is just some hotkey options. This is really just to set up your arm a little bit different from how it is in the factory. I don't even think that you have the ability of doing this since all of these options are already available in, in RDS. So we'll kind of ignore this right now. So now that my arm's connected, I've tweaked the settings and I'm ready to go ahead and get started. Let's talk about some of the other icons on the live capture tab here. Um, we'll start with the live align tool. This essentially allows me to probe reference geometries off of the part that I'll use to pre-align the scan data to the CAD coordinate system in DesignX before I even capture any data. That's really nice because the probe, as you're well aware, is a little bit more accurate than the scanner is. Um, but I'm going to skip this right now because Greg should be in his demonstration showing you how easy it is to use those regions to align our part to the CAD coordinate system after we've done scan data. That's kind of our preferred method here, but for a little bit more precision or for somebody that may be coming from more of a CMM based workflow where they like to set up their uh, origin ahead of time, this is an option here. Um, the live capture option is really where we're going to be doing the bulk of our scanning and probing. So we'll get back to that in a second here, and I'll just talk about these other two options before I go any further. Live model is going to also use my probe or my scanner to allow me to scan uh, areas of the, the part that I'm trying to model, and it will create solid or surface geometries based off of that. 
Basically, it uses some of our modeling wizards in the background, and you'll see some of that during the scanning demonstration, or actually the, uh, the modeling demonstration that Greg does in a few minutes here. Live geometry is similar. It just allows me to do reference geometry, so planes, cylinders, axes, points, that sort of thing. Use the probe to collect more basic kind of rudimentary uh, prismatic data that way. All of these things will actually, or at least especially the, the live model here, will build me a history-based model in my history tree. And I'll let Greg talk about this a little bit later on down the line, but one of the unique things about DesignX is that this functions a lot like how SolidWorks or Inventor or Creo or Katia, any of those major mechanical CAD packages, uh, history-based packages do, where we actually do a design history here with sketches and reference geometries and extrusions and lots and sweeps and make an editable file inside of DesignX that can be transferred into other CAD systems, not just as a dumb, solid, you know, I just step parasolid file, but actually all of this design history will be ported over as well so that the end result is a file that you can edit inside of SOLIDWORKS or Inventor or some of those other CAD systems. So these tools here will create, and of course all of the, uh, the modeling wizards and some of the other workflows that we'll do, they'll create editable files, not just in DesignX, but also in uh, other CAD systems downstream. Um, we can get a DRO here if we want to just take some real quick reference measurements uh, and figure out where our probe location is. We can do a move device or what some people call a leapfrog. Um, and we can even customize, customize the interface to remove some of these redundant scanners that you're not going to need to con connect to ever and some of these other plug-in devices here if we want to go through some of that. Um, some of that might be, I think we can create a, a custom toolbar and put that into the um, uh, the sales toolkit that we've got developing for you guys as well. So what I'll do is I'll hop into live capture here and that's going to bring open kind of my DRO and some scanning or probing options here. Um, by default, the scanner is on this. And since the scanner is connected, the laser is actually active right now as soon as I move the arm off of home position, but I'm not going to start scanning yet because the first thing that I do want to do is actually use a clipping plane. Now, I've been doing a lot of scanning in my garage the last couple of days. So when I enable that option for the first time uh, or you know, in a new scanning session, it's gonna try and reuse the plane that I had created in a previous session. So that plane that appears on the screen there in red is actually the same plane that I had created earlier this morning or yesterday, whenever it was that I was doing some testing out here. Um, that's not something that's going to be an option for most of you guys doing a new arm setup in a conference room or wherever it might be for your demos. So if we want to set a new plane here, what we do is we hit the capture plane button, which activates our laser. And I'll go ahead and pull the arm off of the home position here. My laser activates. I'm using an RS3, like I said. And I need to, I can use my probe to do this, but it's just easier to go ahead and grab my laser, do a quick scan on my table. And I'm, again, uh, depending on how you have everything set up in RDS, it should be set so that you press the trigger to start collecting, press it again to stop collecting. You don't have to hold it down unless you specified that in RDS. And then right click or click one of the side buttons to accept. And what happens in the background is we'll best fit a plane to all of that scan data. And then specify some offset above that table down here in this uh, lower option where we don't collect any data below that point. So I'm doing about a 50 thousandths of an inch offset. So that'll raise up that plane just slightly off of my surface so that I'm not collecting any of my table. Once I'm there, I'm ready to scan. Once I've created that, I'm, I'm ready to go. My laser's still active here. So I'll move my part into a place that's easy for me to scan it. And I'll go ahead and start collecting data. It's important to point out while I'm scanning that every one of these individual scan passes that I create is going to create a new uh, mesh object in my history tree here, uh, which is currently minimized. I know most of you guys do end up doing your scanner demonstrations, especially for the uh, inspection application where you pull the trigger once, blast the entire part, and then just stop scanning right at the end of that process. And 
given the fact that the encoders and Romer arms are generally pretty good, that's not a terrible thing to do. But we also have to understand that the setup that we're going to be scanning uh, on at a customer site, whatever it might be, um, may not be the most ideal scanning setup period for you know, doing any, any actual measurement. It may be that you're on a tripod that's on carpet, uh, especially, God, you know, God forbid we're at a trade show because those carpets are always really squishy. And so the data that we're going to collect is not always going to be the most um, reliable. So I always recommend keeping them as individual passes because if there are, is any scanning error, we can compensate for that just by registering with a best fit all of our individuals probe, or sorry, all of our individual point clouds. Um, if I had just created one mesh out of the whole thing, I may not be able to correct for any of that uh, going down going down the line. Now, in something like Design X, we're not limited. The the file that we get out of Design X is not limited to the quality of the scan data. One of the things that Greg will hopefully show is that even if we are missing scan data in certain locations, it's not the end of the world. We can use our design knowledge and kind of uh, engineering insight or design insight to fill in some of the gaps. And that's going to have to happen on this part because in some of these deep holes here, I'm not able to get perfectly complete data. But if I can see the feature overall, I can definitely measure it and I can definitely design around and fill in some of those gaps using my own knowledge of this part. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time scanning this thing. I did scan it in two halves here. Um, I've got time, Greg, if you've got a little bit of time, I was just going to run through a mesh buildup wizard really quickly. I don't want to talk too much about all of the scan data processing, but we do have a really easy to use tool that allows me to align these two halves of the data and create one merged mesh. Um, out of the whole setup. And it actually prompts me, DesignX prompts me to run that tool as soon as I exit my live capture tool. When I click OK here, once I've done, uh, you know, finished scanning, I get a prompt saying, do you want to run a automated scan data process, basically a macro to process the scan data upon exit, uh, continue or use the mesh buildup wizard. And I'm going to select this mesh buildup wizard option, but first I'm going to save the file because it's always a good idea to save a backup copy here. This is just going to prompt me to put this somewhere on my desktop, which I've already done here. Replace it. And immediately I'm thrown into the mesh buildup wizard tool. Now, this is only something that I really think you need to do if you are uh, doing the top and the bottom of a part. Per se, if you're just doing the top of a part, it might not be necessary to go through this whole process here. But this essentially is a walkthrough guide on taking your files from the raw mesh format that we create when we're scanning all the way to one aligned, unified, and merged mesh that we're ready to start modeling from. So, Greg, do you want to take over now or do you want to give me another two minutes just to run through this process? I don't know. I don't want to step on your toes. I don't know exactly what you have planned for today. Oh, he's muted himself and now he can't unmute himself. Yeah. Ah. Can you, can you, uh, <laughs> yeah, when I'm controlling your computer, it won't let me unmute myself for some reason. So I had to. Right. Yeah. That's Yeah. Weird. Go ahead. Go ahead and walk through that. Okay. Um, I won't, like I said, I'm not going to do a, a full guide here. I'm just going to walk through kind of what this tool does. Definitely some practice would be helpful on your end. But uh, this is going to be a multi-step process to go from, like I said, raw where we are with two halves of the scan all the way through into a completed file. Um, the setup stage here is just going to ask me where this data came from. This is a line laser with a CMM arm. And they're not pre-aligned because I've got both the top and the bottom here. Uh, finished. I do. I can skip the data editing stage though because I clipped out the table. I don't need to really remove any dangling polygons or anything like that. I'll just hit the next stage here and go directly into the alignment stage. So pre-aligning is going to ask me to select one of my two scan groups here, and I just box select over everything that is all connected on one side. Select moving on the other. 
select the other half there. Now, my job here, and you've seen this in plenty of other software before, is just to rotate these two parts around until I can see the similar, a similar view on the screen and click three common points on both of them. Not having to be super precise here because we are going to optimize this alignment later, but just clicking those three same similar points on the other side until the preview in my left hand side here looks good enough to move forward with. When I hit apply, if I had a third group of scan, now I could select that, add it to the this window and repeat that process, or I can move through the next stage here, which is the best fit aligning stage. So I'm going to let it best fit all of the scans to themselves, and we'll have a much more high, uh, high confidence alignment here between all of those individual scan passes uh, that I had. The last step that we'll do here is combine all of them into one mesh by going to the next stage mesh construction option, and then hit go. And what we'll see is instead of all 30 of those individual scan passes here, I'll be left with one mesh in my history tree, and I'll be ready to go from there. So all of this can be automated, including the rough alignment that I did with those three pick points earlier. We can actually do a, a global kind of best fit move. Um, we can talk about scan data processing later on in a little bit more detail, or we can do more of a technical deep dive if some of your teams want to see that. But as far as I'm concerned, that's basically the collection of data um, and processing down using the mesh buildup wizard until the point that we have just a single mesh here. Now I'll go ahead and let Greg take over. I've actually got to hop off of the call. Actually, I can stick around for a few minutes at least. Um, and help answer some questions if any come through in the chat. But I'm going to put myself on mute. And Greg, I am going to stop sharing my screen now. So that's good. it for can me. You guys, can you guys see and hear me? That looks good and sounds good. Perfect. All right. So <clears throat> along the lines of what uh, Sean showed, we'll just continue on moving through a workflow. So. The one thing that I'm not going to show today is uh, the alignment to the world. I'm going to move a little faster into the modeling section. Um, but as Sean mentioned, you can use the regions that we create coming out of the scan processing like we have here. Um, we can use this interactive alignment and select regions and align the part to the world coordinate system. And as Sean said, if we decide at a later time to do more of a deep dive into some of this, we can talk about that and I can show different examples of how to align. But today what I wanted to do is just focus more on model extraction tools. I usually like to pull a few different things, extract some different things from the scan data and show some different techniques for modeling from scan data and then show a transfer over to a CAD package to show how it comes across as native entities. So as we've reiterated over and over again um, today, DX is essentially like having a CAD package and a scan data processing tool all in one. And like he said, the history tree is over here on the left hand side. So as I start modeling, you'll see it populate the history tree throughout um, this top uh, list here. Down at the bottom, we have all the different objects in this model manager here. Um, so you can turn things on and off, hide and show them, you know, click on them and change properties and things like that. Um, so that's what this area is. So without a doubt, probably the most important tool inside of DesignX for model extraction is gotta be the mesh sketch uh, tool. So if you're familiar with CAD, um, you know, when you go to model stuff, many times you start with a sketch, right? And you'll draw either a 2D or 3D profile and then utilize that for different modeling techniques. Um, but what's missing inside of the CAD packages is the ability to capture um, the scan data inside of that sketch and use it as a reference. So you see here, if I create a mesh sketch, there's a lot more options than there is when you create a regular sketch because we do have a lot of different functionality built in here. When you have scan data in the background, it necessitates some extra tools in there to help you extract what it is you're trying to pull. So right out of the gate, when I click on that plane and hit 
uh, mesh sketch, the first thing I usually do is position that plane where I want to intersect the mesh. And the reason why is you saw at the very beginning when I click that plane, the plane on the bottom like bisects the flange over and over and over again. And that's not exactly what I want to draw. I want to bump up that plane to offset a little higher through that flange. But you'll see that dotted line at the bottom. Wherever I intersect this plane, it will project that polyline back down to that original location. So that is the first tool that's really handy in here. Another one is the ability to create multiple slices. So you see here, I can create a cross section and then hit this plus sign. And then I can move it to another location and I can hit another plus sign and I can capture multiple sections. So I could drag higher in the part. And if I want to use all those as a reference, I can have multiple cross sections. Another really interesting thing is the ability to average those sections together. And then it will create one continuous polyline and average them together. Um, and then finally, one of the most important ones that we utilize here, and I'll just cut, I'll just delete those and then just create another one real quick. Let me just, uh, just get out of it, go back in again and pull up by far what the one tool in here that I utilize the most is this ability to create a silhouette. So many of you that have seen our software before, I can actually change the thickness of that plane and it will project that entire silhouette down to that plane. And in in this 2D fashion, it's really handy. But where I find it um, to be the most beneficial is we actually do this in a rotational method as well. So if I had a radial part um, where I, the main feature of the part was a revolve, let's say like a, a, a rim of a vehicle is a good example. One thing that you can do is you can do a, a rotational uh, silhouette and flatten that to one plane and it'll allow you to draw and average out and create a cross section of that data um, and be able to make a more intelligent uh, cross section from that scan data and reverse engineer the design intent, right? So today I'm just gonna cut one cross section, but I like to highlight some of those powerful tools inside of the uh, uh, mesh setup because uh, those things that in some cases I don't think exist in any other software. Once you create this mesh sketch, you have a very familiar interface to CAD packages where I can, I can grab sketching tools and draw, for example, a horizontal line right there. And you see that I can drag that horizontal line and actually snap it to the scan data. So that's one way that you can interact with the scan data. Another one is I can just roll over. The software will automatically try to find straight lines in that cross section for you. And if I just roll over and click, the software will extract those uh, straight sections for me. And then another way to, to draw these lines is I can actually just window in and best fit. So I purposely exaggerate this to show anything that's turquoise, that turquoise color, it's gonna best fit a line to whatever I've selected. And I can select and deselect, and you'll see that it'll update the selection for me, right? So it's real easy to quickly best fit things to the scan data. And then finally, uh, you know, after drawing thousands and thousands of cross sections on scan data, uh, we figured there has to be a better way to extract uh, some of these dimensions, especially if you're just trying to draw it exactly as is. So we built this tool called AutoSketch. Um, and the AutoSketch works two different main ways. You can actually tell it to automatically draw all, all the arcs, or you can tell it to make only selected ones. So in this instance, I'm just going to tell it Go ahead and make all of them. And you can see that it's auto sketching everything that's there for me. And if I want to, I could tell it to draw everything and then I can just delete things that I might not want in here. Um, so even if it gives you something that you're not 
expecting, you can always come back and just remove things that you didn't want in there. And you can even edit them afterwards. So if I come in here and I just drag this up here and I remove that bump and I come in and apply a tangency constraint. And again, this is important to note too, that we're, we're doing CAD type relations, constraints and dimensions. So I can come in and I can apply tangency. I can grab the dimension tool and I can apply dimensions to all of this geometry. And all of this stuff comes across to CAD when I send it over via the, li the live transfer tool, right? So if I get out of the sketch and rotate the part and look at it from the side here, you'll see that I drew it in position directly over top of that flange. Now I can come in and just do a regular extrusion and I can just drag the part, drag the extrusion up and down. And you'll notice it's highlighting some regions if I slow down give the meeting a second to update you can actually snap it to regions and those regions can help you figure out what dimension you might want to make it so i like to often use this where i snap it to a region and then come back and override it so i'm just going to override it to a 0.2 extrusion and then hit ok so now if i just hide my solids um, hide my mesh, show my solids, you can see that we were able to extract that flange. Now, if I want to edit this, again, highlighting the fact that we're a history-based CAD modeler, you'll see that the original sketch is there. And I can hide and I can go back normal too, and all my uh, relations and constraints are there. So you see, as we send this over to CAD a little later, you'll notice that that all comes across the same way. Um, so after, again, drawing lots of cross sections, even using the auto sketcher, um, we were looking for other ways to improve and make it faster to reverse engineer parts. And that's where the wizards come in that Sean had alluded to earlier. Um, so creating these extrudes revolves lofts and and all those features can be very time consuming. And there are instances where maybe a user wants to capture exactly what's there and just let the software create those uh, for them. Um, so that's where these regions come in really handy. If I turn on my regions, again, just to reiterate the regions, we go through the entire scan mesh and basically group triangles by common curvature is the way I like to describe it. So you see that fillet? the angle between those triangles is all around the same angle and we group them together. And what that does is it makes it very easy to quickly select <laughs> and um, repeatedly select scan data and utilize it for other tools down the road. And one of those being um, extrusions. Um, so if I just come over here and you'll see that we have a bunch of different wizards, I'm gonna use the extrusion wizard in this instance and it, basically is asking for these groups of information. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna select all the different sides. And I'm gonna, so an extrusion, right, is a profile extruded along a direction. If I just tell it, these are the, gonna make up the profile and then I can say, this is the top or bottom either way. And I don't actually have to fill the top or bottom categories. I can just let it figure out the rest. And then I can dictate what type of geometry it's going to create. Is it going to create a solid and, in, and create it? Or is it going to merge it with the other solid that might be in the uh, document? Is it going to do a surface? So I'm just going to tell it to insert a separate solid body. And then I hit next. So you'll see what it does is it calculates the direction. It draws a sketch profile automatically and then gives me a preview of what it's going to create. And at this point, I have the ability to edit these dimensions. So if I wanted to click on that and just say, this needs to be uh, 0.545, that is how far it will extrude it. And then when I hit OK, you'll see that it creates it. So now we automatically created that from, from the scan data. Now, when we auto create something, we don't lose that history connectivity over here. 
uh, if there's something that I am not happy with in that cross section, I can come over and I can hit edit again, hide my mesh and then go normal to and I can, you know, apply more constraints or dimensions or redraw that. And then if I was to change it, like drag this line out, when I get out of the sketch, you can see that it updated the CAD model. So it's all history based there. If I just hit undo, it'll go back. Um, so, so far we've created some uh, model information, um, but what we were talking about in the original PowerPoint is during the design process, there are many times where you need to validate the design. And we like to do that in process while you're designing the part. If you come over to the accuracy analyzer, you can turn on deviation from body. And what this will do is do a 3D comparison between the CAD model bodies that we've created so far and the scan data and then graph the deviation between the two. And this is, in many ways, it's similar to doing a 3D comparison like we all do in our metrology softwares that exist, right? But the purpose of doing it now inside of the software is to kind of validate the design as you go. So if you've ever done um, a lot of reverse engineering or scan-based design like this, you can make a mistake early on in the design process, and then it would take a little while to repair or fix later on downstream. Or if you were designing something without having the scan data in the background, you might actually create a model, go start cutting the mold or cutting the part on a CNC machine and realize that you made a mistake. These uh, color plots are to help us catch our mistakes along the way and validate what we're trying to create and make sure that we create what you're intending to create. It even helps you find errors along the lines where you might have missed a feature. Um, so being able to do that deviation from body is really important. Now, we have a lot of different wizards for extracting sweeps, revolves, lofts, all those different things. And they save a lot of time in extraction, but sometimes you need to cap, uh, you know, model something that's a little more complicated than just um, an extrude or revolve. Um, so you see that we have a loft wizard up there. In some, in some ways, what I like to do is just demonstrate the different methods for extracting the shape of a more complicated model. Now, this part is pretty simple but I often use this little radius here to show some of the other tools that are really powerful for capturing the shape. So if I was gonna surface model something that might be like a lofted surface or a freeform shape, uh, we do have the ability to not only do a 2D mesh sketch, but you can do 3D mesh sketches as well. So if you have a more complicated part, you can actually sketch directly on top of the part itself. You see that I'm just drawing right on top of this mesh. So there are many times where you have a very elaborate organic shaped part. Maybe it's a, some sort of casting shape. You can actually sketch model directly on the, the mesh itself. And in this instance, if I just form this outer boundary, I can come over and you know run a boundary fit on this part and then have it automatically extract a surface from that mesh. Now, in this instance, um, our boundary fit is a little bit different than like a SolidWorks boundary fit. Our boundary fit is going to fit to the boundaries of the uh, splines that I drew on the mesh, but it's also going to snap those inner surface points. And once I run this, you'll see it run those blue dots, they're all snapping to the scan data itself. So it's going to drape a surface over top of the mesh and fit it exactly to that shape. So you could see with a different part how that would be really handy to go around and surface model a part. And you can even, once you create this, you can extend and trim and stitch different pieces together to create a really elaborate model from there. Um, so now, once I've extracted some information, I'm not gonna go ahead and model this whole part. 
Um, but what I'll do is just take these features themselves and send them over to SolidWorks, which I have open here. Um, so in order to do that, I come over to the live transfer tool and I'm gonna select SolidWorks. And you have a variety of different methods of sending over. If I just wanted to grab one entity from this tree, you know, you can say only selected entities and send that over to SolidWorks and then just continue to do whatever project that you're looking to do. Um, there are instances where you might want to um, roll back in the history on the tree and then resume and, from a selected feature and have the software send from there forward. Or in this instance, what I'm going to do is say start from first feature and then hit send. Now, before I do that, because of the way uh, Teams works, I'm going to show my SolidWorks screen and then I'll hit send on my Design X, and then you'll see the stuff come across. So it looks like it's showing SolidWorks. So I'll go ahead and hit send from Design X. So in this instance, I did not have a part open yet. I just told it go ahead and send, and it opened the part. And then you'll see that it created all those entities inside of SolidWorks. So I'm just going to hit OK that it, it, it succeeded. And then, like we were saying earlier, um, it sends these over as native entities. So if I come over to that original sketch and I hit edit and go normal to, you'll see that the dimensions that I pulled out, the constraints, the relations, they're all there intact. Um, so there's a variety of different methods here. You can send over all the things at once, like I just did, or you can send them over as needed. Um, it just depends on the project that the customer is working with. And you can also send over um, the auto-surfaced geometry um, that uh, we mentioned earlier on in the PowerPoint. 